um, and um, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, uh, Taiwa's book uh, for me has been very important to think through some of the, the global systemic issues at play uh, with uh, reparations as you, as you point out. I also think that it's very productive to think about um, in terms of national redemption with the various ways in which um, uh, these discourses reproduce the nation as a white possession, as Eileen Morton Robinson would, would argue. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of um, sort of work in that tradition does that. It, it sort of reinscribes the idea that it's white people's country to carve up, it's white people's land, it's white people's wealth, you know, that is sort of the subject of, um, or that, that, that is, you know, um, the source of reparation and that the reparation is given from the white nation whose legitimacy is not questioned um, to, um, you know, variously racialized people. Um, and that leads me to sort of the second point to think about reparation discourses in, in other parts of the world um, and specifically in the, in the context I've worked on in South Africa um, where, you know, uh, I mean, I don't want to say there is no reparations discourse because that wouldn't, wouldn't be true, but there, um, the, the 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 discourse is land back, you know, uh, Israel to our land, um, expropriation of land without compensation. So in the South African context, you see sort of the traditions of uh, um, kind of you know uh, radical black activism and indigenous activism come together because these categories of of you know enslaved and black versus indigenous and racialized etc. don't make as much sense. Um, uh, in our context, but also then you get a, a politics of of reparation that is far more connected to the ultimate base of uh, um, uh, dispossession, which is uh, alienation from land. Um, so I, I, th I think that that for, for me that's kind of the central issue also in in the American discourse that is that it's not enough about land. <laughs> I, th I that's you know I think that's absolutely absolutely right and it's interesting that you know I mean one of the things that has changed dramatically I would say in uh, maybe 15 years I'm not quite sure how but but within the field of black studies in the U.S. is um is an acknowledgement of the entanglement of Black and Indigenous claims. So part of what's so powerful, I think, about Christy Dodson's vision, um, which she connects directly to land um, and tries to think about what does it mean to articulate a Black feminist vision that is tied to a relationship to land, even as it is also a settler relation and mm -hmm. how to how to you know come to terms with that. And um, I... I a year or two ago, I, I'm trying to remember. I mean, it, I I attended a, um, a lecture that Robin Kelly gave on reparations um, that was um, very much, you know, land, it was you know reparations and the land back movement together, and I think that that's um, that's a really important movement. Um, it's it my my. It sounds like that those two ideas have been connected in the South African context, maybe longer than they have in parts of the North American context, um, but that, that that they cannot be disconnected, I think is now really yeah. crucial. But they are disconnected in some of the leading demands for reparations, particularly the ones that are focused on um, the kind of genealogical links between individuals who are descendants of, um, of uh, racial slavery, and that's what I think one of the real um, the real challenges. I'm 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 interested to know more about where things stand with the the movement in South Africa. I mean, has is it getting some traction? Um, so the the South African movement is. Uh kind of mired in a whole lot of other issues at the moment. There are a few South Africans here in the group that would, would, would be able to uh, to speak to this. I don't want to like represent um, uh, everything. 
the, the, the period that I researched um, was a period during which there was a, um, a, a mounting social movement for uh, a, a an amendment to the South African Constitution, which would change the property clause. So, Section twenty five of the prop, uh, of the South African Constitution. Um, that um, the series of um, uh, public consultations, etc., that has gone on in South Africa around um, amending that clause, has not actually resulted in concrete legislative or transfer action. Um, mm -hmm. So this. It's kind of like a big political thing. The political parties are getting people to vote for them by saying they're going to change the constitution to make white property ownership more tenuous, or to sort of make it sort of you know so that you can suspend it in in cases where there is a um, a rep reparatory um, uh, um, uh, demand. Um, but the logic of the state in articulating that is still very much tied up in a kind of you know standard neoliberal discourse, you know. You know, we're doing this in order to increase agricultural productivity, for example. So, you know, we're doing this in order to uh, empower small farmers or, you know, so so uh, not, you know, trying to kind of have cake and eat it to say we are going to loosen property rights, but we're not going to threaten uh, wealth or the economy at the same time. And because that's such an impossible thing to square, I think, you know, it's just kind of nowhere at the moment you know it's it's a it's a big slogan um, without much concrete uh, action from government uh, but of course uh, in a South African context uh, land activism and occupation etc uh, continues apace and this is sort of in the context of the post-1994 liberal dispensation which was also very um, kind of you know, you know, I suppose it's a parallel to the genealogical argument with reparations for slavery in that people actually had to prove a legal um, uh, sort of genealogy of that that specific parcel of land was specifically owned by your specific ancestor. Um, and that uh, kind of there was a paper trail of some sort and that, you know, the expropriation the, the disposition had happened at a, a particular point, I think after 19, I, I can't remember the exact date, but it was the early 20th century. And only if you could prove that paper trail uh, were you entitled to, um, a, uh, to, to, to a land transfer. And even those then got, you know, uh, completely hamstrung because it was so expensive for the government to do that. And there were so many other priorities. Yes. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a mess. Good, good. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the for the for the response. Um if there are any other questions, if anyone has a question they can ask. Makoni, you are muted. I was asking Unyeri whether she wants to say anything. Oh, before, before Unyeri comes, Vishen has a question in oh, the chat. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Vishen, Vishen, jump in. No, I'm, I'm reading her question. Oh, okay. Can you speak more about, Vishen is asking, can you speak more about reparations for indigenous peoples? And she thanks you for the talk. Okay. So it's 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 such a great um a great question. I mean, there's in the US context, there's um, you know, sort of taking with one hand and returning with the other in some senses, so that there have been um some settlement claims, even as the the land continues to be um under enormous, you know, in, enormous stress and vulnerability. Um, probably the the standing rock pipeline um would be, you know, one powerful example. Um so it's it is um a, a an issue that that you know I've I've been thinking about and learned a great deal from from um, scholars like 
uh, Eileen Morton Robinson, who are also looking at indigenous struggles um, elsewhere. Um, and it it strikes me that the you know that that thinking about um, the resonances and the you know the uh, between these different struggles is is really critical. But I think one of the you know the primary challenges, and I think this gets um, you know to Scott's comments a minute ago, is that um, is that we have property regimes that don't um, that don't make the idea of land back intelligible in some senses, at least in the U.S. To um, the um, it's um, you know. It, you know that the, the point that it's not enough about about land I think is absolutely um is is absolutely essential and and part of what we have in the US um is uh you know is basically layered forms of dispossession so you have dispossession on top of dispossession so you have um the descendants of enslaved people who are dispossessed of their own land that was itself also stolen from prior occupants and um the one of the ways i've been trying to think through some of these ideas is is actually through um through literary work um one of the figures who was thinking about these questions for a very long time and i think increasingly um is Toni Morrison. So for example, um, in her 1997 novel, Paradise, where she's thinking about sort of what would it mean for a black community to establish itself as a free community um, in what was then, in what was what is now the state of Oklahoma and really trying to come to terms with, well, first of all, how the kind of traumas are layered on each other um and um and also to refuse a kind of um you know i mean we we in the us i mean it's an you know an interest group politics model to refuse the kind of divide and conquer model as as meaningful um and to think instead about sort of how these stories um are um entwined and um and and I'm I'm looking now at the chat too. I think that the question of, you know, um, ongoing genocide. I mean, it, as you may know, in the U.S., the, there was a uh, congressional hearing a few days ago where um, college presidents were put, um, uh, you know, were were asked to talk to the question of genocide, but it was not the genocide of the the Gazans or of the Palestinians more broadly that they were asked to think about. So. I do think that this notion that um, that we can, um, you know, address one set of issues by silencing others is is really quite, um, you know, is 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 quite disturbing. That there's a choice in some sense that to talk about black reparations means. Um, not talking about indigenous um, claims to talk about anti-Semitism means not talking about um, the um, the destruction of Palestine. You know that 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 these these um, either or um, choices I think are really quite destructive. I think that was more of a rambling answer than a question. <laughs> about, um, oh, Chanel, that's a very tough question about um, practice of land land acknowledgments. I, I'd be interested to hear more about what you know the views are of of you know sort of everyone who's in, involved in these um, in in this conversation on on uh, land acknowledgments. I mean, I again, I think that the I think that that the acknowledge the lack of acknowledgement sends a signal. Um, but um, you know, I'm part of a university that is is expanding um, across the you know the local community. We do not pay property taxes as an you know as a nonprofit institution, and so I again I wonder about the disconnect between the kind of the rhetorical performance 
and the practice. I think that's that's the real um, the real key. I do think that they serve an educative um, purpose insofar as, um, you know, I, I think that so many of us, and I would include myself, are too frequently un, you know, um, unknowledgeable about the land that we're on at, you know, at different, you know, as we move across different spaces. Um, but I don't know, Chanel, since you asked the question, can I ask what you think? We don't do this in South Africa. And this is the first time that um, I, I actually realized it when um, I joined the Global Forum and I've seen lots of my colleagues um, who have this at the bottom of the email mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I've seen conferences and I've heard people say this at the start of, of, um, of, of, the, of the talks. Um, I, I, I don't know how I feel about it. What, what is it, what, what is it um, as you say, what is it linked to? Um, so if you're merely saying it, um, is it is it an act in itself, um, as Ahmad would say, or is it actually um, is is it a performance, or is it um, linked to things that university is practicing um, in, in terms of of reparations? Um, so I, I'm not I'm not sure what 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 I feel about it. I I just thought about it in relation to the fact that we don't do it in South Africa, and what does that then also mean? Mm. Um, and as you were saying, it can it can serve an educational purpose. Um, and it took me a while to get to a point where I knew a lot about even my university and where it's located, who was here before. Um, because mm -hmm. that information is not readily available. And that is also for me, that was also an interesting thing. Um, why are we not um, you know, educating ourselves about it? But um, yeah, I see Scott has has his hand up. Um, and I know that I, I've seen Scott at the bottom of your email, you do have it, right? So I, I just quickly wanted to mention, uh, uh, Chanel, that uh, I this is one of the problems we, we're um, addressing in a, in a reading group we have here at Penn State on indigeneity, where we're trying to address issues of, of kind of translation between contexts, where the, um, uh, the North American um, knowledge production about, uh, you know, coming out of Black studies, coming out of Indigenous studies, is just so powerful and so central. And that, of course, around the world, we then start uh, citing them. We start sort of like adopting their practices. So we start, and sometimes without translation um, and without actually thinking about what would this mean in our context. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, of course, with land acknowledgement in South Africa is that it's just so incredibly politicized and they're like there are layers of apartheid dispossession and genocide that that make saying these are the original lands of x um you know a very politically complex thing to do um and you know even the distinction between you know saying that like you know some people khoisan people are indigenous and other people somehow aren't mm -hmm. like other black people are like all of those things are just so very, very complex in South Africa that I think it's it's one of those practices that it would we we have to do a lot of intellectual work to um, uh, to to transport them into an, into South African context. I wonder if it's I wonder if we need to have an original point that we can that we can say it be, it belongs to whoever whoever. Is it not just enough to say it was stolen? Is it not enough to also just acknowledge that in the first place, right? Um, and maybe that is a conversation that we first need to have before we need to do the tracing. Um, so I don't know. I think that that for me is there's a reluctance to even say that at times in 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 South Africa. Well, certainly in the U.S., I think there is, but there's I think a further issue too, which is, um, and I was struck by this actually when I was teaching this semester, reading Tocqueville of all people, and um, I had a student who was talking about um, uh, about indigenous genocide with a kind of confidence that this was as um, was something that was affected in the past, that is that it was not ongoing. So I think that's also um, like as a crucial epistemological kind of gap in the US. I and mean, this is Joanne Barker talks about the idea of indigenous life as just gone, 
um, which is simply untrue, you know, untrue. So there's a, there is a way in which there's a kind of um, sense of locating settlement in the U.S. anyway, as something that happened in the past. And um, I'm not sure whether land acknowledgements, I mean, I think land acknowledgements typically speak to that insofar as, you know, it's unceded land. So it's not just that it was stolen in the 17th century or the 18th century, but that there's an ongoing struggle, there's an ongoing claim. And that's, I think, you know, at least for my undergraduates, that's where the real gap is, that they they really accept a kind of notion. Um, they see racial injustice against Black Americans as an ongoing concern. Um, and... Uh, racial injustice and 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 theft and you know um, the dispossession of indigenous peoples is is not is not something that many of my students anyway understand is is a present present day um, issue. Um, there was a question about. Uh, uh, I was about to read. Oh, that. go ahead. I, I'll let you. <laughs> And so um, Marie Haneda is asking, how might reparations within the U.S. context look like if we were to embrace what Deborah Thomas said, mm -hmm. um, your quote of the 2011, as in global in scope? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think about, um, uh, you know, uh, U.S., certainly think about U.S. foreign policy. Um, and, um, in, you know, the, the fact that, that there was in, you know, just this past week, I mean, so little will, um, to talk about serious commitment to climate change. Um, you know, so this is something that one might also take from, from Taiwo's argument, but I've also been, this isn't global in scope, but I think it gets at, you know, sort of global concerns. I mean, one of the things that I think that's so powerful about Ashumi's work, which I need to, you know, which I've only just begun to read, is the way that she um, connects um, questions of racial justice to bordering and the way borders are produced and reinforced. And, you know, it is, a, you know, in a time of unprecedented movement of people across borders off, you know, with um, that the, um, that insofar as reparations, um, questions of reparations are tied not only to um, ongoing forms of indigenous dispossession, but also to questions about who can who can come in, who can leave, you know, and, and under what conditions. Um, I think that would be one, you know, one piece of it. Another piece is um, to think about. Um, you know, I mean, what are the contemporary relations of of the U.S. with, um, you know, with with the rest of the world in a in a different? I mean, this this obviously is very far from anything that the U.S. State Department is going to em embrace. But you know, when I think about um, last year, there was a really powerful, I mean, just horrifying image um, in uh, the U.S. newspapers, and it it may have, um, you know. It, it, I imagine that that it was um, it was reproduced elsewhere of uh, border patrol agents chasing Haitian migrants on horseback, and what that captured not only was about for me anyway was not only the racialization of the border but also um, the long history of U.S. Um, interventions in Haiti, um, the long history of you know that that of of U.S. contributions to, you know, to the reasons that these women and men were on the move in the first place. So I think thinking about how to connect reparations to questions of migration and immigration would be one way. Thinking about, as Taiwo does, how to connect it to climate justice would be another. Um, those are, um, you know, certainly thinking about debt relief has been, you know, that's a recurrent um, refrain, I mean, the international organizations that are located, you know, in the U.S. Um, that have played such a powerful role 
in restructuring the economies of um, formerly colonized places. That would be another piece. Thank you. Um, Anissa had her hand up. Anissa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Edwin. Thank you very much, Professor Balfour, for your commitment to this very, very deep and complex subject. And uh, you really enlightened me in a great way here. Now, I have one comment and one question. My comment is that words like democracy, repatriation, they really confuse me because, mm -hmm. because they come from the field of consciousness, to my mind, but then everything is executed by the morality or lack of morality and the interests of the people who have the strings to the purse. So there is a strange divide here, which this is why, <laughs> well, anyway, you know where I'm coming from. My question is, looking at the case of Liberia, was that, was that some form of repatriation or was it just getting rid of the overflow of the free slaves or... And if it was a form of repatriation, it's interesting, what is the follow-up? Because it ended up being one of the poorest countries in the world. Yeah, yeah. Now that's that's such a such a great question. I mean, I I still, you know, I, I think it was a colonization project in the sense of in the US um as um policymakers, so people as you said, who have the you know power of the purse had we're trying to conceive of what a post-slavery society would look like. Uh, I mean, Thomas Jefferson, who founded the University of Virginia, um, wrote uh, on behalf of abolition, but with the idea that multiracial democracy was not a possibility and that colonization was the only alternative. Um, I mean, this is one of the reasons that um, David Walker's appeal in 1829 has, which is a, um, it's an appeal to the colored citizens of the world. And there are four parts. And one of them looks specifically at, um, at the harms of colonization. Um, and he's focused, you know, largely on the fact that enslaved people in the U.S., you know, built the U.S. So that, that the idea that somehow they would, they should need to leave. But, but I, I don't see that there's any kind of reparative dimension to um, the way in which Liberia was established or how it's been, you know, it's, it, you know, how the U.S. is related to it um, over the last couple of centuries. So, um, I mean, I think you're putting your finger on a really, you know, this is, this is the, the question um, that I've, struggled with in, in thinking, you know, the, the work that I did on Morrison, thinking um, with Du Bois and others is if the notions of democracy that are most available to us, um, modern democracy um, came into being hand in hand with slavery and colonialism. Um, how do we defend a democratic ideal? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know of an alternative. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, I, Juliet Hooker uses the language of white democracy. And, you know, what is it, what is a democracy, you know, what does it mean to think about a form of freedom that isn't predicated on someone else's subjugation? Um, and I, I honestly don't, um, I, I don't, don't have a good answer um, other than to keep asking the question. Thank you very much. Well, democracy started in a most undemocratic way, as far yeah. as I'm, because the women had no right to vote. Yeah, slaves the plebs it was just the senators and i think it's going on that way yeah so we're very true to greek democracy today we need to redefine 
Thank you so much. No, that's it. You know, uh, I'm, uh, Michael Hanchard has a wonderful book that traces exactly that phenomenon that you're describing from, from the Greek city state sort of through to the, the contemporary. But I wonder, you know, what the what the alternative is. I mean, I think that's that's the I mean, I, I, I you know, I mean, I um, I think that the the particularly given how entrenched um, you know, various forms of, of racism and property regimes. And, and, you know, I, 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 I can't go the anarchist <laughs> route because I think that's going to be even more dangerous for people who are disempowered already. But I, I, um, it, it does put you in a position of arguing on behalf of an ideal that has always been discriminatory, has always been exclusive. Or puts me in that position, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, I keep coming back with the same thing again and again that I think, as a hum, as the human race, we need a little injection of spiritual intelligence. Mm. We're good at logic. We're good at all kinds of other and you know, intelligences, but very very lacking in spiritual intelligence. And it's, it just shows a dramatic lack of consciousness that's leading us into all these horrific situations. Yeah. I mean, that is where um, I, I think not, you know, I, that's where I think artists have, you know, not, not as a panacea and certainly not in the sense that somehow art teaches us how to be a particular, but insofar as it, you know, different kinds of forms can can open us to um, to seeing things differently. Um, that may be one, I think that's one sort of sort of source of possibility. Yeah. Well, I agree with you so um, wholeheartedly, but then it's art is open to interpretation. So it's read if it's read by people with minds that are not <laughs> wanting to look at what it's yeah. saying. Yeah. Because no, absolutely. I I think maybe it, you know because we're you know facing such a um, in the U.S. the the kind of um, uptick in censorship and you know book banning and that kind of thing has become so extreme that um, if nothing else, I think it's a kind of backhanded testament to the power of those words to um, to challenge the status quo. But it's um, no, I think you're absolutely right that that uh, um, it's open to interpretation and it's not necessarily tied to, uh, you know, re a real rearrangement of, of relations of power. Yeah, I mean, art and poetry as well does quite mm -hmm. a lot, it reaches the heart, but it reaches the people who are open to it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, so thank you so much. Um, Scott has a question on uh, your positionality, how it affects your work and the kinds of responses you get from other scholars in the United States. Okay, great. So um, I've been working in African-American political thought for my entire career. And um, when I started, there were um, there were lots of people doing the work, but very few people in the field of political theory as it's formally defined. Um, and so it may be that I had access sometimes to spaces and to people um, that as a scholar of color, I would not have had access to, um, but it has been, um, you know, I, I remain very committed to this work as a project that everyone has a responsibility to take up, but also not, I mean, I'm very mindful of, um, taking it up in a way that's not um, presuming a kind of leadership or a kind of authority, that it's um, it's a matter of being res responsive to the questions and to the work. And I have not had um, 
I mean, I think I've been very lucky in my career, but I've I have had found both with other scholars and with um, you know, with my students that there is a hunger for conversation about these questions that um is you know that that you know, I mean, in my view, I mean, if I think for instance about my own institute institution, um it, it's horrifying to me how few scholars of color we have, um, how few black scholars we have. And I, you know, my my dream for my department is that I, I would be replaced um, by a team of, of um, you know, by a, you know, a group of, of young scholars who come from all different kinds of backgrounds, um, you know, that are more reflective of the world that we live in. Um, but it has not been, um, you know, I have not encountered a lot of, um, um, I haven't encountered a lot of resistance for the, for the work. And I, and I know that I'm very fortunate in that. Um, and I also know that there's a, you know, that, that as a, you know, my position, not only as a white woman, but also as a tenured professor, means that, you know, I have a lot of protection that many, many of my colleagues, many younger scholars simply don't have, especially as tenure is disappearing. Yes, no, I'm trying to encourage Unyere to jump in, um, <laughs> but she's very quiet. She doesn't want to respond to my- I will jump in, I'll jump in. <laughs> 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 okay. I want to be quiet today, but okay. No, no, you're not allowed to be quiet. It is what it is. Okay. It is what it is. <laughs> yes, it is what it is. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Balfour, for this uh, wonderful presentation on an issue that I often see as um. I often compare it to a forever chemical situation. Mm. You know, um, because it's we're going to talk about reparations uh, for a very long time, and we're going to have different views on what form refer reparations should take, and so on and so forth. So, um, and and as you rightly said, it's not limited to the U.S. It's you know all over, and there's also a new dimension to it, um, which is that. African Americans are not only asking for reparations from from the U.S., for example, they are also asking for reparations from um, African countries. Um, you know, now situated on the lands where uh, you know slavery took place, and I think that there's been some response in some way um, by certain countries, especially. Ghana, you know, asking, you know, African diaspora, especially, you know, descendants of um, African slaves who were taken elsewhere to come back, you know, mm -hmm. to, the, to the land, to the nations. Um, there's also something else happening in Sierra Leone, for example, where if you are an African-American and you can actually trace your ancestry to a particular, maybe ethnic group of family, um, person in Sierra Leone, then you are eligible for a Sierra Leonean passport, and it's actually happening. So um, if we can see that as a, a form of reparation, then maybe it's taking place somehow um, on the African continent. But mm. it's, yeah, it's still a long, we still have a long way to go. Um, the other thing I wanted to say uh, is about Sierra Leone itself. That is the, not Sierra Leone, I'm sorry, Liberia. Mm. The, the ex-slaves who either were repatriated or maybe out of their own volition wanted to return were not that many. At least some studies show that there were just 600 of them that actually moved mm. to Liberia. And many of them also died there because yeah. they were not used to the climate you know, and so on. So um, the irony of it all is that um, when they themselves got there, they didn't. Uh, they behaved more like the colonizer and the, you know, right. 
<laughs> you know, to the to the locals, to the people, you know, who were there. And so uh, if you want to trace the the conflicts in Liberia and the long war, you know, that it had, you have to go back that far. Mm -hmm. Come from it's come from there. The political class for a long time or the ruling class or the elite of Liberia have been generally people of um, descendants of those ex-slaves that returned. And the relationship with the locals uh, has been very, you know, I don't know whether to say toxic or something, but it's not been a very smooth one for, for some time. Maybe mm -hmm. it's getting better now. But for for a long time, it was it was not smooth at all, and that would um, explain why uh, what was his name Doe had a coup, you know, and um, mm -hmm. other people, you know, other conflicts arose and so on and so forth. The irony is that many African Americans today who are advocating for a return um, also see Liberia as a success. Um, yeah. something successful right you know that they went back and they established a country look at you know look at what it is now and so on and so forth and they've used this as an argument for for african countries to to carve out some part of africa for them to return to mm. and i've said to many of them dream on because yeah. this is not 1848 yeah if you want to come back to africa and live there because it's, it's the land of your ancestry fine come and do that nobody's stopping you from doing it but if you're looking for a country a separate country to be carved out for you um right. that's not going to happen at least it's not going to happen in a long time mm -hmm. you know um so so when, when we say liberia you know um is one of the poorest countries in the world and so on yes it is but there are certain people who don't see it from that perspective, or you don't see Liberia from that perspective. They think it's a success story mm. as far as the return of ex-slaves is concerned and the, the ability to, to establish, you know, what eventually became a country and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, um, and, and, and they factor this into the reparations argument too, you know? Mm. So it's, it's, it's a very complex issue, like you rightly observed. And, um, we're going to talk about it, you know, for a long, long time. That's what I have to say. Oh, that's that's really remarkable. I mean, I, 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 there's clearly a lot more I need to think about and learn about, um, you know, with the Liberian, um, Liberian case. I mean, I, um, first of all, I think the the comparison of, um, you know, the the legacies of of slavery to forever chemicals is brilliant. I mean, I, I wish I had thought of that. I mean, I, it's, um, I mean, I think it's, it's terrifying, but it's also, I think, so, so very true. There is a way in which, um, you know, when I think about the, the kinds of claims on African land by African Americans, which is not something I'm, I'm particularly familiar with, but it does, you know, it, it, it reminds me in many ways of, of how we might think about, um, you know, the legacies of someone like Marcus Garvey, who on the one hand, insofar as he had a vision of what he called a great African Republic, um, which did have a kind of colonial, um, you know, I mean, it was a colonial vision in important respects. It was of, of um, uh, members of the diaspora from the Western hemisphere, you know, coming back to lead in important, in important ways. So there's that vision, which I think you're rightly suggesting we should, you know, that, that should be pushed back against. But on the other hand, um, you know, even if that dimension, I think of Garveyism is worthy of critique, what Garvey was able to do in terms of the number of grassroots organizations he his vision, he seeded, um, seeded S E E D E D, not not C E D E D, um, is extraordinary. And so many of the liber liberation movements in North America we've seen in the last century come out of Garveyism and that he had a global vision that he was 
thinking about the ways in which African Americans were connected to people in the Caribbean, connected to people in Africa, that piece of it, I think, is very powerful. And I hope that that can be, you know, I think disconnecting um, whether it's white colonization schemes um, or um, notion of a of a right of return that comes with some kind of expectation from the vision of the interconnectedness. Um, that's um, I think that that's part of maybe that's going back to my answer to think think about sort of what Deborah Thomas is working towards um, in her own thinking about. She talks about reparations as a language. Um, it becomes a, a mechanism for connecting present day um, concerns to this this longer longer history. And her work is primarily on Jamaica. So she's looking, you know, again, if we think about sort of dislocating sort of U.S. focused efforts, um, looking at all of the you know sort of the ongoing damage that's been done by U.S. interventions um, in Jamaica. Um, so thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm moving away a little bit from, from the question of, of Liberia, but I do think that the, the notion of, of, um, of, of the connectedness, the interconnectedness of these struggles is so, so crucial. Um, the other thing about, um, about the uh, the relationship between sort of African American struggles and um, uh, and African politics um, is that there's a you know I mean one of the things that is so powerful if you study um, the movements in the U.S. in the 1950s and 60s the degree to which um, you know African American struggles were inspired by. Uh, you know, African anti-colonial movements and, and anti-colonial movements else, you know, elsewhere in the world. So it it decenters, you know, the US as somehow, you know, the place that has learning to export and rather shows the ways in which, you know, struggles outside the US have been essential for even, you know, even for the civil rights struggle. It was never um a whole, you know, I mean, King was so deeply influenced by what he saw elsewhere, for example, um, and the kind of insistent Americanization of these movements, I think, undercuts the power of those other, those other struggles. Yeah, and if I can just um, add, maybe just to correct an impression, I am actually an admirer of Gavi, mm -hmm. you know, and the interconnectedness that he was seeking and so on. What troubles me is the misinterpretation of, you know, what his intentions were by modern day, you know, people who want to look at it in a different way and that sort of thing. So yes, there's that in interconnectedness which should be promoted, you know, mm -hmm. um, because we are all interconnected, um, but we must not abuse it. Yeah. Yes. And, and and be very colonially minded about it in the name of interconnectedness. Because it's it's really it's happening now. And you go to some forums and you see that it's it's a heated topic. It's a hot topic of discussion. And there are people on this side um of the of the continent, when I say side or well, side of the world, mm -hmm. uh, in the in uh, North America. Um, especially African Americans, whose thinking is not really different from the colonial masters, and who feel that they are the saviors, they are the modern day saviors of Africa, that they need to go to mm. Africa and save it, you know, and, and which is troubling to me. So that's the thing I'm, I'm looking at. As far as Gavi's philosophy, you know, the underlying his underlying philosophy and so I have no problem with that it's just mm -hmm. that people are taking it you know to a different direction and you know trying to do other things and they don't see that they're actually sort of repeating or using the same um, tactics or methods of the people they are mm -hmm. you know they are criticizing so if you're criticizing the west for example um, you're also using its tools in order to achieve what you think um, 
is is the more humane aim um you know of, of fighting for for equality and justice and all that i couldn't agree more <laughs> yeah um i i think there are no more questions but i, I wanted to say something about ghana before i conclude mm it over um so i'm from ghana and when when it comes to african americans coming back to ghana and the government ghana ghanian successive ghanian governments have been very pan-african in nature mm -hmm. uh, so their policies and free passports or all those things and they, they target african americans who want to go back home and then there's free land some chiefs and some leaders, traditional leaders, give free land, but the land should be used uh, profitably for the for the benefit of the society. So they give you free land, and you can do a business on it and employ the people because they think you are coming with capital. So then they are giving you the free land, but at the same time, you have to do something with it so that it can benefit the society. And you realize that at, at a very micro local level, people have a sense of reparations people have a sense of coming back and people have a sense of um there's an interconnectedness between those the slaves the descendants of mm -hmm. slaves moved from Africa and those who want to come back and so while Unyari was talking I was thinking of all these things these people mm -hmm. might not be theorizing or they might not be academics but at a very local level they have this understanding of the need to go back you know that yeah, it's it's so powerful. I mean, I think the connection between micro politics or, you know, micro level, you know, that, that, that you can't separate them um, one one from the other at all. Thank, thank you so much. I, I would like to end the formal session and hand it over to Vishina so that Vishina announces the next speaker, the speaker for next week next week next year <laughs> next year 